Ireland. Um, we're here despite a determined and cynical campaign by feminists to stop our talks going ahead, a campaign based on nothing more than lies and misinformation. This evening, people wishing to attend these talks have faced a loud and angry mob seeking to block their entry into this building. And doubtless, doubtless um, men, many were disinclined to stand up to such a vassal and didn't blame them. But the, the mob is still outside making a lot of noise, a wonderful audio accompaniment to our talks, I think, to be honest. And I'd like to thank them for proving that feminists have no interest in issues affecting men and boys, no interest in their suffering. And I'd like to thank Cambridge University for providing a platform for Elizabeth and I to talk to you tonight. I'll be talking about 18 areas where the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the state's actions and inactions in the UK today. The same issues can be seen in many other countries, but like Elizabeth, what I have to say is particularly relevant to the English-speaking world. This, this banner is the one we placed next to the 20 speakers at an event we hosted at Excel London last July, the fourth international conference on men's issues. People attended that conference, um, including many women, I've got to say, from, twi from 24 countries and from as far afield as New Zealand. I was originally going to deliver this talk three months ago at the University of Winchester in an event at which William Collins, an important blogger on gender issues, was also going to speak. We'd been invited by Eric Anderson, a very publicly gay American professor who works there. He gave a talk at the last London conference titled A Non-Feminist's Approach to Masculinities, and the video's on our YouTube channel. Feminists at the University of Winchester tried to have our talks cancelled with a campaign of lies, information, of lies and misinformation, just as they've done here in Cambridge, and in the end, we cancelled the talks ourselves to spare Eric Anderson any more stress. As I think um, Elizabeth pointed out, um, there are these accusations about, um, there are always these accusations about uh, harassment, including of individual students and academics. Um, they couldn't come up with a single damn example. Not one. Not, not at Winchester, um, and not here at Cambridge either because there are no such examples. I'd like to say a few words about William Collins' website, The Illustrated Empathy Gap. In my view, and in the view of many men's rights activists, MRAs, around the world, this website is the gold standard among the websites covering gender issues from a non-feminist perspective. The site currently contains about 170 articles, and he has a book being published in the next month or two, titled, um, not, not surprisingly, the Empathy Gap. It's almost 700 pages long, which will give you an idea of uh, the scale of the problem. The Empathy Gap is behind so many of the problems facing men and boys today. Put simply, society cares about women and girls in the class and cares little or nothing about men and boys in the class. It explains why states can, assume, can assault the human rights of men and boys as a class with utter impunity often at the behest of feminists, as we'll see, and they do so. So uh, my talk will challenge feminism and feminists for the simple reason that most of the issues facing men and boys in the UK today are the consequences of feminist activities, or at the very least, made worse by them. The Fawcett Society is a radical feminist campaigning organisation, and it commissioned a survey in 2016 which found that only 9% of women <coughs> in Britain self-identify as feminists, and just 4% of men. I think we, we can clearly say from this, at least I certainly would, that feminists have no legitimacy to speak on behalf of women as a class. My aim in this talk is simple yet ambitious, to give you a sense of the extent to which the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the state's actions and inactions in the UK today. And here's the important thing, why are they assaulted? Almost always to privilege women and girls. Feminists claim that they're fighting for gender equality, but to achieve gender equality, women and girls would have to give up many of their privileges. And I don't, I don't see any feminists fighting for that. In 2013, I launched the political party Justice for Men and Boys. It remains the only party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the human rights of men and boys on many fronts. It's also the only anti-feminist party in the English-speaking world. Um, and we, we've been anti-feminist from day one. And it's been good in recent, uh, in recent times to see other political parties in Europe 
starting to, to challenge credit, and I think that's really going to uh, that's really going to grow. Um, a few words about the leading events in the global men's rights movement. In 2014, Paul Elam, the head honcho at the Voice of Men, um, a very important men's rights website, um, he, he hosted uh, the first international conference on men's issues in Detroit. Our own party hosted conferences in London in 2016 and 18, and in 2017 there was a really good conference in Gold Coast, Australia. The fifth conference in the series will be held in Chicago this coming August, three months away. The key hosts will be Karen Strong and Alison Timo. Canadian women who have been prominent anti-feminists and MRAs for a decade. And the keynote speaker will be Professor Janice Fiumengo, another Canadian anti-feminist and MRA, and the creator of a remarkable video series, The Fiumengo Files. Now up to, I think, episode 104 or 105, if you can go. I'll be giving a talk in Chicago at Elizabeth, along with Philip Davis, a Tory MP who also spoke at our 2016 conference. When it comes to human rights violations, men and boys in the UK today beat women and girls 20 to 0. And yet feminists tell us that women in the UK, like everywhere else, are oppressed. So the state privilege is one class, women and girls, so the rights of the other class, men and boys, must be assaulted to enable that privilege. This is a zero-sum game. How could it not be? For men and boys to enjoy equal rights as women and girls, inevitably means that women and girls will have to lose privileges, or men and boys gain more rights, or a combination of the two. For the past four years, our party's number one campaigning objective has been to end the non-therapeutic circumcision of male minors in the UK, male genital mutilation, or MGM. MGM is carried out on male minors, some of them uh, babies, in Jewish and Muslim families. Our YouTube channel on the subject contains a playlist of over 90 videos and audio pieces, including some videos of our campaigning on the issue at Speaker's Corner. The materials that we hand out and promote include the Jewish case against circumcision, as well as the Muslim case. And on two of these placards, we have the URLs of those extraordinary websites. So, uh, just a few words on MGM. Firstly, contrary to, po to popular assumptions, MGM is always highly enjoyable. Always. William Collins has posted four excellent pieces on MGM on his blog, um, the illustrated empty gap. The first one pointed out that over 90% of the nerve cells, um, specifically mycinous corpuscles in the penis, which give men pleasure during sex, are contained in the foreskin, which is of course removed during MGM. In an adult male, the skin removed during MGM as a minor would be the size of a five pound note. The objective of MGM is to reduce the pleasure of men enjoy during sex. In his other three articles on MGM, uh, William Collins debunked the claim of medical benefits. Now there's a specific act criminalizing female genital mutilation, FGM, and it was passed in 1985. The state has expended huge resources on ending FGM since at least that time, but only recently was the first person, a black Ugandan woman, successfully prosecuted under the act for her conspiracy to have FGM performed on her daughter. Now, it's a little known fact that prior to the 1985 Act, carrying out FGM was, in common with MGM, already a criminal offence, by virtue of it being at least actual bodily harm and almost certainly grievous bodily harm with intent, under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. Balvinda Mihat, a Nottingham based doctor, was arrested in 2017 in relation to the circumcision of a five month old boy, allegedly without the mother's consent five years previously. The proposed charge was grievous bodily harm with intent, which carries a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. So we know that the criminal justice system is damn clear about what MGM is in terms of law. Um, now, predictably, the Crown Prosecution Service refused to bring a prosecution. So a few months ago, I lodged papers at Nottingham Magistrates Court for a private prosecution of Dr. Meehat. A judge refused me leave to bring that prosecution. And one of his reasons was that there had never been a successful prosecution for MGM under the 1861 Act, ignoring the bloody obvious fact that no private prosecutions had ever been permitted to take place. This is the world 
This is the world that we live in. The people try to end this, this criminal butchery. Every second Sunday, we campaign at Speaker's Corner in London, sometimes on the issue of MGM. And people are often astonished to learn that MGM is illegal in the UK. They understandably assume that the lack of prosecutions is, is somehow evidence of legality. But it isn't. A substantial body of case law makes it very clear, very clear, that no exemptions to the law of the land are permitted on religious or cultural grounds. It would require a parliamentary override for MGM to be legal, and that has never existed. The, the UK government recently announced grants totaling £50 million for initiatives aimed at ending FGM in Africa, and at the same time it's receiving income taxes from the criminals carrying out MGM. The double standard is outrageous, and stark evidence, I think, of the empathy, uh, the empathy gender gap. I'm now going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of many men's and boys' issues, the 18 on this panel, to be precise. Uh, and you'll find up evidence. You'll, you'll find um, evidence in our manifesto um, to, to back up everything that, that I'm about to say. If I had to choose just one area where men and boys should enjoy equal rights, it would be parenting. Denying children access to their fathers is child abuse and emotional abuse of men, and the state is deeply complicit in that abuse. Warren Farrell, in his book *The Boy Crisis*, cites a 2016 survey of social workers, the report on which included this conclusion. Social workers tend to consider the children's wishes as long as their preferences, their preference is for maternal custody. When children express a paternal preference, their wishes carry no weight. End of quotation. Jermaine Greer wrote the following in 1970, almost half a century ago. Women's liberation, if it, abolishes, if it abolishes the patriarchal family, will abolish a necessary substructure of the authoritarian state. And once that withers away, Marx will have come true really nearly. So let's get on with it. End of quotation. In the past 50 years, the entire institution of the family, underpinned by a lifelong commitment to marriage, had been overturned. This was driven by feminist politicians such as Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt, who wrote, I think it was in the New Feminist Review, uh, in a report there in 1992, it cannot be assumed that men are bound to be an asset to family life, or that the presence of fathers in families is necessarily a means to social cohesion. End of quotation. Imagine you're replacing the word, word, the word father with mother in there. The impacts on young adults of both sexes of growing up not living with their biological fathers is very well documented. Those adults are less likely to attain qualifications. They're more likely to experience unemployment. They're more likely to have low incomes. They're more likely to be on income support. They're more likely to offend and go to jail by a very, very considerable margin. They're more likely to suffer from long-term emotional and psychological problems. They're more likely to have children outside marriage or outside any partnership, perpetuating the, the, perpetuating the problems. The carnage wrought by fatherlessness is obvious to anyone willing to see it. The knife crime epidemic among black boys and young men in our cities is largely driven by fatherlessness. Boys and young men without fathers are obviously at a much higher risk of drifting into gangs. Okay, I come on to reproductive rights. In this area, women have rights, but only the responsibilities they choose. Men, in contrast, have no rights, only responsibilities. So if a woman becomes pregnant, perhaps without the prior agreement of her partner, for example, if she fails to take a contraceptive pill, without knowing, a form of paternity form, of course, she can have her unborn child killed at taxpayer's expense. The father has no say in the matter. She can have the child and put it up for adoption. Again, the father has no say. Or she can demand that he financially supports the child for 20 years. The child he never agreed to be responsible for. Education. 
There was virtually no education gender gap prior to the 1987-88 academic year. That was the year when O-levels were replaced by GCSEs in order to give effect to the pro-girl bias of teachers, to raise girls' grades relative to boys' grades. And that gender gap has been with us ever since. William Collins wrote a very good article on the matter. About 60% of university students in the UK today are women. Um, and because government thinking on all matters is influenced or dictated by feminist politicians, the educational failure of males is not seen by the government as a problem. The worst performing cohort of boys in education is that of white working class boys. The two education secretaries before the current one were both feminists, Mickey Morgan and Justine, Justine Greening. They, at no time did they even pretend to be bothered about the educational underachievement of boys. And seen through a feminist lens, boys underachievement is something to be celebrated. Sadly, I don't have time to go into the obscene taxpayer-funded initiatives to drive up the proportion of women studying STEM subjects, or women being appointed ahead of better qualified men as a result of the Athena Swan Initiative which leads to a lack of research funding for departments which wish, which wish to make appointments based on merit alone. Quite an old-fashioned concept there. William Collins has written 16 excellent articles on education, and uh, I think three or four of them are on uh, Athena Swan. Okay, I turn to employment, and I'll start with research carried out by Dr. Catherine Mackin, a renowned sociologist who published a paper on Moxie-term preference theory in 2000. She investigated the orientation of men and women towards paid employment and found that while four in seven British men are work centred, only one in seven British women is. On those grounds alone, we might expect 80% of the people working in demanding professions or at senior levels which require strong commitment to be men. Yet the state, driven by feminist ideology, is in utter denial about gender differences in work orientation as it's in utter denial about so many differences um, between men and women. And it does all it can to drive women into the world of work and away from caring for children and others. Feminists demand an increase in the proportion of women in well-paid roles, in prestigious roles, in roles where flexible working is available, in office jobs, and in roles, in, and in roles entailing little or no risk to life and limb. They see no need to increase the proportion of women in poorly paid roles, or in dirty and dangerous roles, such as those that account for 97% of workplace-related deaths being men, or in roles requiring a lot of time spent away from home, such as long-distance lorry driving, or working on road platforms, or fishing trawlers. No, that would be totally the wrong sort of equality. So feminists don't campaign for those things. Elizabeth, can you pop down and ask me a bit more quiet? <laughs> I turn to the feminist scam of equal pay for work of equal value. Major retailers are currently facing demands that they pay their checkup staff, mainly women, more to match their warehouse workers, mainly men. Of course, the obvious thing for a checkout worker wanting more money would be to apply for a job as a warehouse worker. Kind of a known practice, isn't it? Um, to, to, to apply for a job which pays more. Um, the notion that they're equivalent jobs is utterly laughable. Claims of equal value always ignore the very things that disincline women from certain lines of work. For example, physical effort, unsocial hours, lengthy commutes to work, unpleasant working environments, risk to life and limb. Okay, I come on to healthcare provision. Healthcare provision for men is, is poor compared with that for women, but I'll limit myself in the time I have here to, uh, to cancer. In 2013, Cancer Research UK published a report titled Excess Cancer Burden in Men. Men are 35% more likely to die from cancer than women. When sex-specific forms of the disease are excluded, such as prostate, testicular and ovarian cancer, the gender gap is even wider, with men 67% more likely to die. When only working age people are looked at, men under 65 have a 58% greater chance of dying than women of the same age. More men die from prostate cancer than women die from breast cancer. The state spends around £250 million um, 
on uh, of its total expenditure of 350 billion pounds on national screening programs uh, on women. Cervical cancer, 150 million, and breast cancer, 100 million. The balance is spending on screening for a non gender non uh, cancer, bowel cancer, 100 million. It hardly needs pointing out, hopefully, that there's no national screening program for prostate cancer and no plans for one. And provision of treatment for prostate cancer is woefully inadequate and underfunded. Domestic violence. On our YouTube channel, we have a playlist of 50 audio and video files on this issue. The mainstream media frequently reports or imply that the vast majority of domestic violence is perpetrated by men against women. This must surely be the most discredited of all feminist myths. It's been discredited many times by researchers in the field over decades. Martin Fieber is a psychologist and since 1978, a psychology professor at California State University, Long Beach. In 2013, he published a paper titled References Examining Assaults by Women on Their Spouses or Male Partners, an updated, annotated bibliography. The full abstract of that paper is this. This annotated bibliography describes 343 scholarly investigations, 270 empirical studies and 73 reviews, demonstrating that women are as physically aggressive as men, or more, in their relationships with their spouses or opposite sex partners. The aggregate sample size in the reviewed studies exceeds 440,000 people. End of abstract. The, the highest rates of violence are found in lesbian. Uh, sorry, the highest rates of violence are found in lesbian couples. Feminist academics have to date been unable to explain how the, to, how the patriarchy causes this. <laughs> in most heterosexual couples where domestic violence occurs, it's reciprocal in nature. The men and women are at different times perpetrators and victims. In the majority, however, in the minority of heterosexual couples where the violence is one directional, the perpetrator is slightly more than twice as likely to be the woman rather than the man. And that has been known for a very long time. Researchers have known all this for a long time and, and have been reporting in their papers. So why is it that the British government is in utter denial about the true nature of domestic violence, <clears throat> as are governments in other countries? In large part, it's because there's a huge domestic violence industry, now almost 50 years old, largely controlled by feminist organizations such as Women's Aid and Refuge. The result is virtually no provision of support for male victims of domestic violence, nor their children. Indeed, if a man goes to his council and explains his partner is battering him, and he needs to leave his, his house for the sake of his life, possibly, He'll be told that if he does so, if he leaves his house, he'll be making himself intentionally homeless. He'll end up on the streets, and, and we know that rough sleeping reduces life expectancy by around 30 years. Divorce settlements. How in the name of God can it be that in 2019, decades after women have had the same opportunities in paid employment, women can still use divorce for personal enrichment? It's simply obscene. 70% of divorces are filed by women, and men are responding in a number of ways, including going mixta, uh, men going their own way. These men, and more than you might expect, more, more than our young men, um, they, they, they're very disinclined to have intimate relationships with women, and in particular they avoid marriage like the plague. Ten years ago I wrote a book on the institution of marriage, following my second divorce, um, well, I certainly never forget the laws with hindsight. Um, the, the book, I, I titled the book The Fraud of the Rings. And, and one of my websites is titled Men Should Marry. This is all I'll have to say this evening about marriage. Uh, not a good fan. Um, okay, we'll move on to uh, Father's Access to Children After Family Breakdowns. The other side of the coin is fatherlessness, of course. Around one in four children in the UK uh, today lose contact permanently with their fathers following breakdowns, mainly due to the failure of the family court system to ensure them reasonable access. This is emotional abuse of children, fathers, grandparents, and others. 
Countless fathers who have been denied access to their children tell of fabricated allegations of abuse to keep them away from their children, and the family courts which won't punish women who flout contact orders. Women routinely flout contact orders with utter impunity. Lawyers are making fortunes from the misery of fathers denied access to their kids. I'll be touching on suicide in more detail shortly, but I'll just say here that the male suicide rate rises very sharply following divorce. We, shouldn't be, we wouldn't be surprised if mothers were killing themselves in huge numbers if they were denied access to their kids. But it's fathers who are killing themselves in big numbers, so who cares? Certainly not politicians. The empathy gap strikes again. Sexual abuse. Few women are held accountable for sex offences, including women who sexually abuse children. It's known from a major American studies, from an American study, survey I should say, from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, that over a quarter of sex offences between men and women are committed by women against men. On that basis, all else being equal, the ratio of men to women charged with sex offences should, should be under 3 to 1. In the UK in 2013, the ratio was 146 to 1. Women themselves can suffer because of the failures of old female sex to account. In 1984, two American researchers, Petrovich and Tendler, reported that of a sample of 89 convicted rapists in a California prison, 59% had been sexually abused as children by one or more women, sometimes by their own mothers. At the last male psychology conference in the UK, Naomi Murphy, lead forensic psychologist at Whitehall Prison, talked about her work with male sex offenders there. 54% of the men had a history of being sexually abused as children by women. And so there's a clear correlation between female sex offending and male sex offending. Okay, we turn to homelessness. About 90% of rough speakers are men, and this seems to be true in most developed countries in the English-speaking world, uh, from what I can see. I've already said street homelessness reduces life expectancy by an average of 30 years. In 2013, a report estimated that three quarters of rough sleepers had some issue with alcohol, drugs, or mental health. Some estimates indicate that 30 to 40 percent of the London sex trade is made up of men, and many homeless men expose themselves to the risk of sexually transmitted diseases when they're forced to sell their bodies for money or shelter. Studies in the London area indicate that around half of all rough sleepers have previously lived in state-funded institutions, whether through being in care of children or later in the military or the prison. Suicide. Suicide is the leading cause of death of men under 45 in the UK in all age groups. Very often this is attributed to men not talking about their emotions when they're in distress, as women are more likely to do. And in fact, in a debate in November about male about suicide, um, a female MP brazenly said that men need to become more like women. This is victim blaming. If a man is suicidal because he's being denied access to the children he loves, what's the damn point of him talking about it? It won't give him access to the kids. It will just remind him of the cruel injustice being done against him. It will add to his distress, not reduce it. Likewise, talking about being homeless or the victim of domestic violence. If you're a, a, a woman and you talk about your problems, you'll probably get help. If you're a man, you probably won't. Well, certainly, almost certainly won't. And that's why men often don't seek help at times of crisis. The government likes to talk about male suicide as being a mental health issue, but that doesn't make sense. The male suicide rate has been fairly stable in the UK over the past 30 years, while the female suicide rate is roughly half. Nobody in government or elsewhere is claiming there's been a major improvement in women's mental health over that period. Indeed, numerous studies tell us that women have been suffering more mental health issues over that period. The prison population in the UK is around 84,000. Over 80,000 of them, or about 95% of the total, are men. In 2014, William Collins published a remarkable piece titled UK prisoners, the genders compared. It ends with the following conclusion. Men are, massive, men are subject to massive gender discrimination in the criminal justice system. If male offenders were treated in the same way as female offenders, there would be only one-sixth of the number of men 
in prison. About 68,000 men would not be in prison if they were female, leaving a male prison population of only 13,000. End of conclusion. So, gender equality in prison sentencing terms would quickly sort out the prison overcrowding uh, crisis and save enormous sums of taxpayers' money. Yet, I've never heard a single feminist calling for women to be treated the same as men in prison sentencing terms. Feminists are instead demanding the closure of women's prisons, and as always, politicians are bowing to their demands. Paternity fraud. Paternity fraud is an egregious assault on men's human rights. There are a number, number of forms of paternity fraud, but with the time available, I'll limit, I'll limit myself to just one of them. A woman leading a man to believe he is the biological father of children when he's not. Perhaps because the man is the woman's husband or boyfriend, that kind of thing. Call me old fashioned. Some years ago, we learned from a Freedom of Information request, the Information Act request we made, um, that the Child Support Agency has for many years known over, five, known over 500 cases annually of paternity fraud after women agreed to men's requests to have paternity tests found out, and the men were found out were found not to be the fathers of the children in question. Not one of these thousands of women, well now many thousands of women, have ever been prosecuted for, for those crimes. Indeed, the Crown has never prosecuted a woman under the Fraud Act for paternity fraud. We're calling for compulsory paternity testing of babies at birth. It would cost very little and would give men the, ch the choice of deciding whether or not to work for 20 years to raise other men's children. Armed Forces Veterans Medical Care. The Ministry of Defence has no responsibility for the mental health of veterans who often struggle with anxiety disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder and an overstretched NHS is very ill-equipped to deal with them. Male veterans in particular struggle, um, struggling to cope with their mental health issues frequently turn to alcohol to cope and this presents a problem. Alcohol is a depressant and it requires more resources to treat someone with possible mental health issues and an alcohol dependency. This is known as the dual diagnosis. Provision of, provision of support for these people tends to be poor. Although it's known that treatment for people with a dual diagnosis is likely to be effective. Veterans with this dual diagnosis are told to remain dry for a lengthy period, often six months or more, before becoming eligible for treatment. Many veterans commit suicide during that period while they wait for the treatment. Sometimes after their problems have reached the point of leaving them homeless. Anonymity for suspected sexual offenders. In May 2010, the Conservative and Lib Dem coalition government agreed that committed to reintroducing legislation to protect the anonymity of suspected sexual offenders until and, until and unless convicted, but later reneged on that commitment following lobbying by feminist MPs and women's groups. The existing law is nothing less than a charter for malicious women to make false sexual offence allegations, thereby destroying innocent men's lives at little or no risk to themselves, because the women are afforded lifelong anonymity. Many male suicides have been attributed to allegations, false or otherwise. For, uh, for many years, it's now well documented, the police and the Crown Prosecution Service conspired to pervert the course of justice by seeking to drive up the number of convictions of men for sexual offences. Men without the money to afford expensive legal representation are treated in the most brutal and cavalier manner. The result has been many well-reported miscarriages of justice, and some estimate that there are hundreds, possibly thousands of men, in British prisons today, the victims of false accusations. We have on our YouTube channel talks of our 2016 and 28 London conferences given by men who were the victims of false uh, allegations, Mark Pearson and Patrick Graham. Political representation. I worked as a consultant for the Conservative Party, sorry, um, between 2006 and 8. And in 2008, the, the party chairperson was Caroline Spellman MP. In a radio interview years later, she admitted that when she was the chair, of the, of, of the party, men outnumbered women applied to be prospective parliamentary candidates, or PPCs, by a ratio of 10 to 1. 
And that very much of the ratio is, is much different today. So the fact that over 25% of MPs today are women reflects enormous preference, preferencing for women over men when it comes to selecting PPCs. The Labour Party, or the Labour Party as we usually refer to it, has long had all women shortlists. The lists were found to be in conflict with the Equality Act, so legislation was passed by the delightful Harriet Harman to permit them. Vince Cable, the leader of the Lib Dems, is on record as saying all women shortlists will be used for selecting candidates for winnable seats. Presumably the party will be preferencing men for unwinnable seats. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all the major parties preference women over men in becoming PPCs, whether overtly or covertly. But the preferencing of any group in selection or promotion terms is by definition an attack on autocracy. All women shortlists have given us MPs such as Jess Phillips. Who <laughs> <laughs> indeed. The Labour MP for Birmingham the Ardley, who, who sought to block Philip Davis's application for the first debate commemorating International Men's Day in 2015, a debate planned to be mainly about male suicide. She came very close to succeeding. Indeed, the other 10 MPs on the Backbench Business Committee didn't say a word against. against Against, you know, against what she was saying, during, during, it was only afterwards, when there was a furor, that, um, that, that Philip was um, allowed to have his debate. Now, I remind you that suicide is the leading cause of death of men under 45 in all age bands. The video of um, Jess Phillips' intervention is on our YouTube channel. It's one of the most popular, the popular ones. Um, Jess Phillips' majority of the 2017 general election was considerably higher than the 2015 general election proving that men are turkeys and vote enthusiastically for Christmas. Like, likewise, all the other men who vote for feminist MPs. Now, Philip Davis is a Conservative MP for Shipley in Yorkshire, and the only politician in the world prepared to talk about men's issues with any regularity. And he admits he can only do that because he, he said in his maiden speech in 20, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2005, I think it was, that he had um, no ambition for ministerial office. Um, uh, he spoke at our 2016 conference about the, about the justice gender gap, and he'll be speaking at the Chicago conference in August. The gender, the gender of an MP should be of no consequence. The demand by women that more MPs be female is simply self-serving. When the overwhelming majority of MPs were men before the modern era, they didn't pass legislation to privilege men over women. In the modern era, with the majority of MPs still men, if there's a gender preference in legislation, it's always in favour of women. Always. Yet many female MPs have been very open about the driving force <coughs> behind the entry politics being their wish to focus on women's issues. Which in practice means that when in office they scheme to extend female privilege ever further, not caring jot about the impact of their actions on men and boys. So there you have it. 18 areas where the human rights of men and boys in Britain today are assaulted by the state's actions and inactions, almost always to privilege women and girls. I remind you that the human rights of women and girls specifically are assaulted by the British state in no areas. None. There is, however, um, there, there is, of course, a Women and Equalities Committee, uh, which uh, Philip Davis remains on. He's a saint, that man. Um, and I think, I think of the 11 members and 9 are women. There's also a Minister for Women. And a Minister for Equalities. Sorry, there's a Government Minister for Women and Equalities, also a Minister for Women, and a Minister for Equalities. You couldn't make this up. Needless to say, all three of these Ministers are women. The, the, the claim of feminists that they're seeking gender equality is demonstrably ludicrous. And I hope I've, I've, I've shown that tonight. Feminists seek ever more privilege for, for women and girls, regardless of the cost to men and boys and wider society. And I remind you that in, in the UK, 91% of women and 96% of men do not self-identify as feminists. At the conference last July, we announced uh, the Non-Feminist Declaration, a document to which both Elizabeth and I contributed, as well as others. And it's available online on our website, and we have a couple of placards with the text here today. So, uh, wrapping up, thank you for listening, and for upholding the noble tradition of free speech at the University of Cambridge. 
which is more than can be said of the howling mob outside. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have either here or later at the Regal Club. Thank you very much.